Welcome everybody and um, it's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here to talk to you about the human microbiome in health and disease and about the work that we're doing at the Burden Institute in this area. And as um, Brendan has touched on, the vision of the Burnett is equity through better health. And our mission is to achieve better health for our vulnerable communities in Australia and as well as internationally by translating our research into sustainable health solutions. So last year, we underwent a restructuring where the Institute is now um, organised into major health programs, as you can see here. And this is important because it brings together our broad technical expertise in life sciences, public health and international development so that we can talk about and, and, uh, and figure out how we can make impacts in these major health areas. So one of the things that I'm going to say keeps me up at night, but probably not, but uh, one of the things I think about is um, how we can increase the impact of our work and um, our access to vulnerable communities. And one of the areas that uh, I think we really need to be developing is genomics. So this idea of understanding the genetic basis of disease, and that means not only the host, but also the pathogen, and in order to increase the impact of our work and um, help impact and helping the, the health of, of vulnerable communities that we work with. And microbiome comes, comes under the genomics umbrella. So what I'm going to talk about today is two um, uh, research uh, projects that we're working on in, at the Burnett Institute in the microbiome area. And uh, they both relate to the vaginal microbiota. So one is looking at HIV susceptibility and the other one, adverse birth outcomes. But before I actually get into that, I really wanted to give you a broader perspective of the microbiome and what it is and what it means and actually start thinking about the gut microbiome first. So what is the microbiome? Well, the communities of bacteria along with fungi and viruses that inhabit different regions of the body, as you can see here. We have microbiota in the gut, the skin, the mouth, the lung the vagina and the penis, so pretty much every surfaces of the body. And this microbiome is, is distinct, uh, as you can see, within an individual. So the vaginal microbiota, so the bacterial communities in the vagina, are quite distinct to the, to the um, gut, as you can see by the different colours. And the microbiome can change with time. So in the short term, the microbiome in the gut can change due to diet. And, and in the longer term, as we age, um, the microbiome can change. And this microbiota differs uh, from in, within different individuals as well. So if we look at the microbiome with regard to numbers, 39 trillion bacteria inhabit our bodies. And that compares to, yeah, that's really daunting. And, th and 30 trillion human cells. So there's a 1.3 times more uh, microbes in our body than our human cells. And so we could consider ourselves as maybe mostly being microbial, perhaps. <laughs> think about that. Um, interestingly, um, there's a lot of genetic information that is coming from our bacteria. So there's 150 times more um, genes that's provided by our host, our bacteria, uh, our bacteria compared to um, human genes. And interestingly, 95% of the microbiome is in the gut. And so it's not surprising that uh, a lot of the work that's been done so far has been on the gut microbiome. So we've evolved over millions of years uh, with bacteria. So co-evolved over millions of years. And so it's not surprising that the microbes are really important for our survival. They make nutrients and essential amino acids. They're really important for development and maintenance of the host immune system. And they protect us against pathogens. So here's a nice uh, a photograph here. Of course, we can't see uh, microbes with the naked eye. So this has been um, amplified or uh, magnified 10,000 times. But here you can see that the bacteria actually cover the surfaces of our body. So that can act to compete against pathogens taking a foothold um, on our uh, mucosal surfaces. OK, so the microbiome can be um, uh, good for our health. But sometimes the microbiome is um, in imbalance. So there's a disruption in our bacteria and we call that dysbiosis. And that dysbiosis is associated with adverse health outcomes. And over the years, I mean, this field's in, in its infancy, but over the 10 years or so, there's been an explosion of publications showing associations between dysbiotic gut 
and various diseases. That includes autoimmune diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, allergy, obesity, cancer. It just goes on and on. But these are associations. So how does the microbiome influence our health? So um, one way that it can happen is that the gut microbiome can be influenced by our diet. And so if you um, eat a low fibre diet, processed foods, they be can become an imbalance in the gut microbiota. And these bacteria, how do they communicate with the host? Well, they actually produce what I call metabolites or little molecular messengers that can get to go through the body and then can actually change our physiology. So it's quite astounding and can impact on disease. <laughs> and conversely, if you have a high fibre diet, right, so I'm pushing high fibre diet, um, that can promote a healthy gut microbiome. And these um, bacteria produce what's called short-chain fatty acids, and you may have heard of short-chain fatty acids. And they can go through the body and they have, have very beneficial effects. And specifically at the gut, they're good at, um, for their anti-inflammatory effects and they're also really good at um, promoting the gut barrier function so that you don't have bacteria leaking out of your gut into your bloodstream that can cause inflammation. And inflammation is a bad thing when it comes to uh, susceptibility to a variety of Western type diseases. So, you know, the modern Western diet can be associated with um, uh, poor health outcomes due to dysbiosis in the gut. And what I should mention is that Dysbiosis is also associated by lack of diversity of bacteria in the gut. All right, so can a good diet promote a healthy microbiota? So I have to mention the Hadza. So um, this is a pre-agricultural society in Western Tanzania. So that's Tanzania and Africa. And uh, these are hunter-gatherers. So they actually exist today as hunter-gatherers and they lack Western diseases and they live on uh, fruit uh, which tubers are shown here, honeycomb, with the larvae as well. <laughs> Still eating your lunch. And, uh, and then game. And uh, these, if you look at the gut microbiota in these individuals, they have greater diversity of bacteria. And uh, in fact, they've got bacteria strains that are not found in individuals who are on a Western diet. And in addition to the diet, it's also the environment. So they are living in an unsterile environment. They're not eating their food with utensils. Um, their food's got bits of animals in there. They're living with animals and so on. So that also contributes, um, I guess, to the microbiome. And I guess you've probably heard about the hygiene hypothesis in the, West, in the West and how that could impact on allergies and so on. So this is a type of, um, I'm showing data here. So this is a, a data showing that we can use um, sophisticated um, DNA sequencing techniques to look at who's there. So what type of bacteria is in the gut of the Hudson population here? So the verticals are actually specific <coughs> individuals and the horizontals are different bacteria. And the more brown the, um, the uh, signal here, the higher abundance of those bacteria. So the huts, so they've got a lot of diverse bacteria, abundant bacteria, and if you compare it to individuals who are on a Western diet, so this is, these are guys from the United States, uh, probably too much McDonald's, I'm afraid, but what you can see here is that um, there's less abundant bacteria and, different di and, less, and lower diversity. And in fact, the, the pattern is different. So there's different bacteria in the huts compared to different bacteria in uh, the Western diet. <coughs> Now, it's not to say that the Hudza individuals, that their gut microbiota won't change. In fact, a study showed that um, uh, their diet does change in the dry season. So in the dry season, uh, they eat more meat, and so that's more Western-like. And their gut microbiota changes to look a little bit more like uh, what a Western uh, microbiota might look like. So if we can actually um, change the microbiota by our diet, an extension of that is the use of probiotics. So who's been, who knows about probiotics? All right, okay. So it's about basically delivering those live bacteria into your gut, the so-called beneficial bacteria into your gut. And I'm going to give you a WHO, World Health Organization, um, <coughs> definition of probiotics. And these are live microorganisms that, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. <coughs> Emphasis, a health benefit to the host, okay? So, you know, there's a lot of probiotics out there. Whether it's actually been proven to um, have a health benefit, well, you know, you need proper clinical trials. Now, this is a study hot off the press 
it was in the last week, published in Cell, a really prestigious journal. And I'll try and make it more high level because it looks very complicated, but I'm going to ask you guys to put your hands up if you've ever used probiotics to recolonise your gut after antibiotic therapy. All right. Okay. All right, so this is going to interest you, this study. Okay, so this is a study where they took individuals who were treated with antibiotics and then they split them into three groups. One group took probiotics, and this was a combination of 11 different bacteria. The second group, now I hope you finished your lunch, um, had an autologous fecal microbiota transplant. I'm call it, call it FMT. And so before they had their antibiotic therapy, um, the, the faeces from these individuals was harvested and then it was reinstilled in these individuals after antibiotic therapy. And then you had a third group where they had no treatment. The really surprising data, I know the numbers are low, but the surprising data is that the individuals who took the probiotics actually um, had a really, um, had a sort of a dysbiosis in fact. So it took them longer for their microbiota to come back to normal. And the, the, the probiotics that actually took hold in their gut had, there was evidence of adverse effects, right? Okay, so food for thought there. Um, the FMTs, well, they did really well. That was really successful. So the autologous FMTs, these individuals, their microbiota recovered really well and, and faster than the sp spontaneous recovery. So if you did nothing, then that's probably another way to go as well. So food for thought there. So cautionary note, guys, regarding use of probiotics. Don't assume it works. You need the evidence. It makes sense. It logically, it might make sense, but you need the evidence. But um, this data actually shows that the autologous FMT works well, and you're probably going to need personalised probiotic approaches to achieve that mucosal protection without compromising um, bacterial recolonisation in individuals treated with antibiotics. So we're thinking now more about personalised medicine, right? Because particular probiotic might, be, not, might not be suitable for your microbiota. Okay, so you know, I've introduced faecal microbiota <laughs> transplant, so a talk about the microbiome would not be complete if I don't actually um, discuss probably the most successful <coughs> use of the microbiota. And that is in the treatment of Clostridium difficile. So 5% of individuals who are treated uh, with antibiotics will get a depletion of the good bacteria in the gut, but as well, as well, they'll have an overgrowth of harmful Clostridium difficile, as shown here. This is the green bugs. And you can see here they cause inflammation in the gut, terrible symptoms, diarrhea. Now, the standard of care um, in this instance is using other antibiotics to get rid of the Clostridium difficile, but there are certain individuals uh, where that antibiotic doesn't work. And so what's being used now is um, FMT, so faecal microbiota transplants, mm -hmm. and it's still by colonoscopy, from individuals who have healthy microbiota. And here they are, ready to go, this liquefied filtered stool, ready to go to be instilled um, into, into the colon. So yeah, it, look, it looks really like a lot of fun. Um, but perhaps this is a more palatable, maybe not way of introducing uh, the faeces, so sort of using <coughs> tablets to get it through. But then, you know, they, these bacteria need to survive the acidity in the gut. And so this is, the, 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 the liquefied stool probably would be the best or more effective way of um, normalising your gut microbiota in this context. So it's 85% efficacy, this particular treatment. Okay, so another um, uh, <coughs> area of interest I think many of you might have heard about is adverse health outcomes for newborns delivered by caesarean versus vaginal births. So the way this goes is that if an infant is born through the vagina, that they will be introduced to the vaginal um, micro, microbiome, and that includes lactobacillus. And that's important for normal introduction of the gut microbes. And then these individuals have a normal immune development, right? If, in contrast, um, you have a caesarean delivery, um, those babies will have skin flora. So they won't see the, the vaginal microbiota, they'll get the skin flora, and then that, that will lead to abnormal microbial introduction in the gut. And that dysbiosis in the gut will increase the risk of that infant to allergic type um, diseases, asthma, 
um, celiac disease, allergic rhinitis and so on. Okay, so that's the theory. Who's heard of this um, caesarean versus, you've heard of, yep, okay. All right, so we now know a little bit more because the baby can also be um, colonised by bacteria in utero, so in the placenta and amniotic fluid, the prevailing view was that there were, it was sterile, but in fact there are very low loads of bacteria in the placenta and the amniotic fluid, so um, the, the uh, fetus can be colonised in utero. And then after birth, there's breast milk. So when the baby's being breastfed, there's bacteria in the breast milk that goes into the gut of the infant. And it's really cool. There's also the, uh, these um, human um, milk oligosaccharides that can only be digested by certain bacteria, such as bifidobacteria, which then are, um, that, that, that can amplify in the gut of the infant and, and give, uh, at, give um, beneficial uh, outcomes or effects. Now, there's a bit of a controversy here. And that's a causal association of caesarean delivery with neonatal dysbiosis. Because um, there's a really um, fantastic study that was published, it's Stinson et al. paper that was published recently, that looked really closely at these studies. And um, what they found was that in the caesarean delivery, they're actually confounded. So there are other causes or possible causes for this dysbiosis that the studies did not account for, okay? And one of these is the use of antibiotics. So antibiotics are used for women that are having caesarean delivery, delivery. So it may very well be that this is true, but we really need more evidence to discount these confounders uh, so that we uh, can then maybe uh, recommend that um, if the baby is born by caesarean, that those individuals, those babies, are then um, coated with the vaginal fluid from their mum. So this is some of the practices that are happening that can be that are happening because of individuals who have actually heard about this particular study. But I think it's really premature to do that because we need stronger evidence to make sure that this is the case. So to discount the confounders. So this is a segue now to some of the work that we're doing at the Burnett Institute, because I introduced the vaginal microbiota. And as um, Brendan said, I work in the area of HIV. And uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, the vaginal microbiota and HIV susceptibility. So HIV, which causes AIDS, remains a major public health threat globally. 37 million individuals are infected with HIV and up to 50% of those infected are women. Now in 2017, there are almost 2 million new infections of HIV infections, and most of these are in sub-Saharan Africa. And despite the fact that we've done really well with um, HIV treatment prevention strategies, um, you know, we still are doing really poorly when it comes to adolescent girls and young women in sub-Saharan Africa because every week 7,000 of these girls and young women are being infected with HIV. Alright, so if we look at um, this, this data here, um, adolescent girls and young women are up to three times more likely to be infected with HIV compared to their male counterparts. And so we know there are behavioural and structural um, explanations for this. For example, they're having sex with older male partners who are more likely to be <coughs> infected with HIV. But we all now know that there are also biological factors and an underlying mechanism is genital inflammation. And that can be subclinical. And that subclinical genital inflammation can be due to sexually transmitted infections as well as the microbiome, so the type of vaginal microbiome in these individuals. So a beautiful study that was published last year has shown that young healthy South African women have, or 58% of them, have diverse microbiota. So I'm going to stop here and say that in the vagina, if you've got diverse bacteria, it's a bad thing mm -hmm. compared to the gut. So in the gut you want diversity, not in the vagina, okay? All right, so 58% have diverse microbiota. You can see from the different colours, that means different bacteria. 32% are colonised with lactobacillus inners. I call this the poor woman's lactobacillus. So lactobacillus in the vagina is a good thing. It's associated with good health outcomes. But lactobacillus inners transitions into this dysbiotic um, bacterial community. So it just flips back and forth. And then 10% of these women have Lactobacillus crispatus. This is a champion of Lactobacilli in the vagina. This Lactobacillus crispatus is associated with 
beneficial health outcomes. So only 10%. So in this study, they showed that women who had this diverse vaginal microbiota had genital inflammation and an increase in what we call HIV target cells, activated HIV target cells in the female reproductive tract that acts as fuel for the virus to replicate. And I think the icing on the cake, and this is a prospective study, we need more studies like this, is that these women were HIV negative to begin with. But with time you can see that they acquired HIV and that the women who had the dysbiotic, the very diverse vaginal microbiota, had an increased risk of acquiring HIV, just over fourfold. And it's interesting to see that women who had L inners, the lactobacillus inners, had an increased risk. It didn't reach statistical significance, so there was a trend towards an increased risk. And what was really fascinating for us was that um, L. crispatus women had, were, seemed to be protected against HIV. So we've been looking at, at the Burnett, how do lactobacilli protect against HIV? So there are two distinguishing features when you're looking at women who have lactobacillus dominated microbiota and those who have high diversity bacteria in the vagina and a condition that represent that is bacterial vaginosis or BV. One is the pH. So with women like the business dominant, dominated microbiota, the pH is less than 4.5 versus a pH greater than 4.5 with high diversity microbiota. The other thing is those, you know, those molecular messages, those molecules that these bacteria produce. So lactobacillus produce lactic acid and this lactic acid is quite uh, at high concentrations with lactobacillus dominated and they are depleted significantly in women with BV. So we hypothesise that lactic acid would be the molecular message, if you like, that was um, uh, conferring the beneficial effects uh, in women. And so this slide um, summarises probably seven to eight years of work, okay? <laughs> it's quite sad. That's all. That's all. That's all. And so basically I just want to, to um, summarise that lactic acid has the effective functions of uh, vaginal lactobacilli. So studies have shown that lactic acid can kill the bad bugs, but not the good bugs, not the lactobacilli in, in that's found in the vaginal tract. We've shown that lactic acid has really potent um, ability to inactivate HIV. And recently we've shown, and this is really exciting, uh, finding that lactic acid has anti-inflammatory effects on the cervicovaginal epithelial cells that could prevent HIV acquisition. And we've also got some data suggesting that it could also um, improve the epithelial barrier integrity. So why is this all important? So we, if we look at women who have lactobacillus dominated microbiota, they produce a lot of lactic acid, that kills the bugs, the pH is low. And you have this non-inflammatory environment called homeostasis. This is how we want to be. And the epithelium is intact. And with individuals who have this condition, uh, there is a decreased risk of HIV acquisition. In contrast, if you have women who have high bacterial diversity, such as BV, bacterial vaginoses, the pH is greater than 4.5, depletion of lactic acid, it's got a, you have a pro-inflammatory environment and that pro-inflammatory environment recruits the target cells. So these are the HIV target cells that the virus likes to infect. And you have a decrease in the epithelial barrier function, so the virus can actually migrate deeper into the tissue. And so in this circumstance, a woman will have an increased risk of acquiring HIV. All right, so a lot of the work we've done is in the laboratory. How are we going to translate this finding, right? And so we've been thinking about um, going to the next level and trying to prove what we found in the laboratory in women. And so we are uh, planning this proof of concept study where we're actually um, developing a bespoke lactic acid containing gel with the right pH, um, with the like, right concentrations, and, and we have a US patent awarded for our discovery of the ability of lactic acid and its anti-inflammatory effects. And what we want to do is um, look at women who have bacterial vaginoses and add this, uh, apply this lactic acid and then see does lactic acid decrease inflammation in the vaginal tract? Does it change the vaginal microbiota from this really diverse BV into lactobacillus dominated? And does it have an impact on epithelial barrier integrity? So we have funding from ACH2 to develop the gels and we're looking for funding to actually do the study with our collaborator, Katrina Bradshaw at Melbourne Sexual Health Clinic, who is an expert on bacterial vaginosis and does a lot of clinical trials. And if we see 
favourable responses in our proof of concept study, that really gives us the basis of for going forward with sustained release formulation. So having sustained release formulations of lactic acid in the gut. So I've talked about HIV um, and the microbiome, um, but uh, what we found with lactic acid and BV actually has broader implications beyond HIV. So dysbiotic vaginal microbiota also increases risk of herpes simplex, um, bacterial STIs such as gonorrhea, and um, adverse reproductive health outcomes such as preterm delivery. And so this is my segue into the Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies <laughs> program, which is a flagship program in Papua New Guinea. And that's where we, Brendan was for a couple of weeks, I think, I guess, looking at this study. So the aim of this study is to achieve better health for mothers and young children through understanding the key causes of poor health and pregnancy outcomes. And this is a study involving 700 mothers and their newborns that have been followed longitudinally. And we've got vaginal samples um, from these women which is of interest. If you look at the statistics, it's quite sobering. 10% of babies suffer from low birth weight and 43% have um, stunted growth. And low, yeah, and low birth weight is an issue, right, because it's a major risk factor for early infant death. 80% um, of neonates deaths associated with low birth weight. And if the baby does survive, it contributes to poor childhood development, stunting and chronic illness. So in a region like Papua New Guinea, there are probably several factors that might be contributing to this, and the study's been looking at what are the major contributors to low birth weight, including malaria. But we think, and, and there's evidence to suggest, that the vaginal microbiome in these mothers might be also contributing to low birth weight. In fact, um, using a different method, we know that 25% of, of these mothers have, are likely to have, have dysbiotic um, vaginal microbiota. And so the type of studies we're interested in doing is looking at the role of the vaginal microbiota in, in low birth weight and preterm delivery, fetal loss and stillbirth, and also if it increases risk of STIs. And then down the track, we want to look at the um, gut microbiome and how that impacts, impacts on infant growth and development and healthy ageing. And you can see here that uh, I've mentioned most of um, our disease health programs. So a lot of the work that we're doing on the microbiome, as, as um, Brendan said, is responsive to many of the health um, programs at the Burnett Institute. So our microbiome or geno genomics um, initiative um, is responsive to three out, of the, three out of the six objectives for the Burnett 2020 vision. So that is using high quality research and knowledge so developing this high-end technical capability in characterising the microbiome, in addition to fostering talented and committed workforce. So these are the guys, not, not old people like me, I don't know how to do this analysis, but it's the younger individuals who are smarter than me that can do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not 21. Um, and uh, translating our research and knowledge um, into new treatments, prophylactics, prevent preventatives and so on. And um, it's really important um, that we do receive um, philanthropy uh, and funding for this and uh, we're grateful we did receive some funding to establish the translational research facility, a component of which is where we've, we've purchased equipment that allows us to uh, take the clinical samples and process them to, to look at the microbiome. So I'm just going to leave you with some facts about the microbiome and health and disease. So I think there's really evidence now emerging that the human microbiome does have a role in health and disease, but it is in its infancy uh, and still in its investigatory phase. A lot of the studies are association studies, so we need more robust studies on causation. There is potential for new therapies by exploiting bugs as drugs, right? So although the regulatory pathway to approval might, is not clear, but the other way is using drugs from bugs, which the example I gave is a lactic acid example. And big, some of the big pharma are really getting into the space because they really think that this is probably the next frontier in the development of new drugs uh, for, for um, treatment and prevention of diseases. I've told you about um, the success story of uh, FMTs for C. difficile. I've also cautioned you about um, over-the-counter probiotics and uh, the claims. <laughs> and that uh, emphasising that, you know, there is, there is promise here and it's personalised medicine approach is going to be needed here. Not one microbiota fits all. 
And we really need evidence-based approach. So well-designed, adequately powered clinical trials are needed to support claims for health benefits of probiotics. With that, um, I'd really like to thank the contributors and supporters of the microbiome studies, um, individuals in my laboratory and, and other individuals at the Byrne Institute, our collaborators. You know, it is um, an, a national and international um, research or enterprise. And I also want to thank um, individuals specifically who are trying to get this microbiome initiative um, going in the laboratory. So Phil Booth, Philip Booth, he's sitting there. David, uh, David's sitting there, he's over there too. Adam Johnson, I can't see him, but he must be somewhere, and Josh Haywood, <laughs> okay. And really thanking these guys, because they're doing the hard yards in the lab, trying to get everything up and running so that we can characterise the clinical samples that we've got uh, for what the, to classify or characterise the microbiome. I also want to thank um, the support uh, from the Burnett Institute executive and the board and from Brendan for supporting um, these studies and also our fund, external funders, ACH2 and NHMRC. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions later on, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.